welcome to the Complete History of Science, Series 4, Episode 5, Medieval Mechanics. The emergence of mechanics as a science in the West begins with an obscure figure known as Gerard of Brussels. We don't know when Gerard was born, or indeed any biographical details, but he appears to have been working in the late 12th or early 13th century. He was amongst a new generation of writers who had access to ancient Greek scientific texts, now available in translation, and these greatly influenced his own writing. His surviving work, Liber du Moto, or Book of Motion, is a minor work, but remains interesting for two important reasons. The first is that he separates mechanics into two parts, making a distinction between kinematics and dynamics. Gerard defines dynamics as the study of the causes of motion, whereas kinematics is a purely descriptive science, studying how objects move. In dynamics, Aristotle was still the foremost figure, as his entire philosophy was preoccupied with determining the causes of things. He defined two types of motion, natural motion of the four elements and violent motion caused by an external mover. However, it was a contemporary of Aristotle, Autolycus, who was the first ancient to try and describe and quantify motion. He said that an object moves at a constant speed if the ratio of the distances travelled in two parts of a journey are equal to the ratio of the times taken. This is a sensible definition, implying, say, that an object moving at a constant speed will, for example, move five times further if the time allowed is five times greater. Autolycus, however, had not explicitly defined speed. This was because the ancient Greeks were uneasy with the idea of taking the ratio of what they called unlike quantities. That is, they were happy to take the ratio of times between two parts of the journey, or distances, but they placed a prohibition on dividing distance by time. The second reason, then, that Gerard's book is interesting is that he takes a step beyond the ancient Greeks. In his Liber de Moto, he assumes that some magnitude can be assigned to the ratio of distance and time, an important first step in the new science of mechanics. Gerard's influence would be felt over a century later, when a group of scholars at Merton College in Oxford began to examine motion, not purely in terms of Aristotelian causes, but by applying ideas for mathematics. Of this group, arguably the most talented mathematician was Richard Swineshead. Like Gerard, few biographical details are available, other than he was a fellow of Merton College between 1340 and 1354. He gained the nickname the Calculator in Posterity, a name taken from his Liber Calculationum, or Book of Calculations. The Calculators was a name subsequently applied to the whole group, which included William Heightsbury, the eventual Chancellor of Oxford, and another colleague, John Dumbleton. Swineshead, Heightsbury and Dumbleton, developed a new framework for analysing motion mathematically, which went far beyond what Gerard or any previous writer had imagined. They carefully defined not only constant speed, but also instantaneous speed, assuming that each could be assigned some value. They did this by distinguishing uniform motion, that is motion at a constant speed, from non-uniform or accelerated motion. This new way of treating motion was a consequence of a broader mathematical and philosophical approach which had taken root at Oxford. This assumed that qualities could vary both in intensity and in quantity. Perhaps this is best illustrated with an example. Take the quality of heat. This can vary in intensity, that is temperature, but it can also vary in quantity, so a bath of hot water contains more heat than a kettle. Another example might be weight, where heaviness 
can be considered the quantity, and density would be considered the intensity. The intensity of a quality was assumed to vary and could either increase or decrease. When this idea was applied to local motion, the idea of speed naturally emerged as the intensity of the quality of motion. Intensification of this quality corresponded to an increase in speed, that is acceleration, and a decrease was deceleration. This provided a clear framework through which motion could be analysed. Through this, the Merton scholars produced a new theory which became known as mean speed theorem. The primary insight of this theorem was that an object which moves at a uniform speed will move the same distance as an accelerated object if the average speed is equal to the uniform speed. This is probably quite unclear, so let's try and clarify it with an example. Take a body with a constant acceleration, which increases its speed from 20 meters per second to 40 meters per second. This accelerated body will travel the same distance in the same period as a body moving at a constant speed of 30 meters per second. This helped them define not only speed, but also acceleration. The Merton scholars proved this theorem in several ways, and Heitzbury, Swineshead and Dumbleton each gave their own proofs. It also spread to the Paris, where a contemporary, Nicole Oresme, gave a geometric proof of the theorem. This involved drawing what we might now interpret as a speed time graph. Oresme represented the motion of a body across a two-dimensional area, where the speed was shown on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal. An object moving at a constant speed on this graph would be represented with a rectangle, whereas the accelerated object would be represented with a triangle. By showing that these two shapes would have the same area, he proved that they would travel the same distance in equal intervals of time. Back in Oxford, the Merton scholars applied their theorem to a variety of problems and demonstrated some of its consequences. For example, they showed that if we compare the first and second half of a journey taken by a uniformly accelerated body, the body will move three times further in the second half compared to the first. This work was foundational in the new field of kinematics, where motion was described mathematically. However, it wasn't just the field of kinematics which was developed by the Oxford scholars, because around this time, another man, known as Thomas Bradwardine, also worked at Merton College. Thomas was likely the oldest of this group, and his biography is a little better known, mainly because, later in life, he became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Born around 1300, he died in 1349, relatively early in his tenure as Archbishop after an arduous trip back from England from war-ravaged France. Thomas's work differed from his colleagues in that he was looking to place Aristotle's natural philosophy on a mathematical basis. He observed that students would often study mathematics before moving on to natural philosophy, but there was little connection seen between the two. His work attempted to combine them, believing that mathematics would be the key to revealing truths about the universe. Bradwardine's goal was to represent Aristotle's theories of motion as mathematical functions. He was not necessarily the first to do this, but he did it much more rigorously than prior attempts. Aristotle had said that the faster an object moves, the greater the force required. Some thinkers then had tried to express this as the force being proportional to velocity. However, Aristotle also believed that the greater the resistance of the medium, the smaller the velocity. So expressed more concisely, the velocity was believed to be proportional to the ratio of force to resistance. Bradwardine pointed out the obvious flaw in this interpretation. When written like this, the equation would imply that when the force is equal to resistance, there would still be some motion, 
because the ratio of force to resistance would be equal to 1. His argument was not intended to undermine Aristotle, rather to point out it could not possibly be the correct mathematical interpretation of Aristotle's thought. He similarly dismissed other suggestions, such as those of John Philoponus. John had implied that the velocity of a body would be proportional to the difference between force and resistance. He rejected this on Aristotelian grounds, as Aristotle had said that doubling the force and the resistance must leave the velocity unchanged. In place of these descriptions, he offers his own law. The law itself is very complicated, relying on the medieval mathematical theory of compounding ratios. But the simplest way of expressing it is by saying that in order to double the velocity, we must square the ratio of force to resistance. Or, if we want to triple the velocity, we would have cubed the ratio of force to resistance. This may seem fanciful, but it was nevertheless a pretty good approximation to Aristotle's theories. The consequences of this theory were worked out by Oresme and Swineshead in the middle of the 14th century, and it was taken seriously by most natural philosophers until the 16th century. Fundamentally, of course, the issue wasn't so much with Bradwardine's formula as it was with the flawed work of Aristotle. Merton scholars were severely hampered by their attachment to Aristotle's theory of motion, whose flaws should have been well known by the 14th century. Aristotle's critics, such as John Philoponus, wrote extensive condemnations of these ideas, and even Aristotle's adherents, like Ibn Sina, had realised they needed modification. Chief among the complaints was Aristotle's writing on projectiles. He had suggested that a force was required to keep an object in motion. This seems common sense, but it frequently fails if we look closely. The classic example is throwing a javelin, which keeps moving even after the thrower has let it go. Even Aristotle had realised the issue here, but had been resolute, suggesting that the javelin would keep moving due to the air behind it pushing it forward. The weakness of this argument had been demonstrated in the 6th century by John Philoponus. He mocked Aristotle's idea by suggesting that if it was true, then armies could fire huge volumes of javelins using giant bellows. John's work, particularly his direct writings, were likely not well known in Europe in the Middle Ages, but nevertheless, some people made very similar arguments. John Buridan was a French natural philosopher and master at the University of Paris. He rejected Aristotle's contention by pointing to some counterexamples. He observed that ships moving along the ocean will continue in a straight line, even when they don't have air in their sails. Similarly, he discussed a blacksmith's wheel, which will continue to rotate long after it's pushed. Buridan was working contemporaneously with Bradwardine and the other Merton scholars, and like them, he was interested in mathematizing theories of motion. Unlike them, however, he was willing to reject Aristotle, propounding his own theory of motion, which he called the theory of impetus. Buridan's idea was that objects in motion have a quality impressed upon them, which he calls impetus. This impetus was imparted to a body by an outside force, but once it had started moving, it would continue to move without the need for any further assistance. This was similar to the theory of John Philoponus, who centuries previously had discussed a similar idea. However, there was one key difference. In Philoponus's theory, the impressed force was expendable. An object would naturally use it up before eventually coming to rest. By contrast, impetus would cause a body to move indefinitely, and it was only due to the action of outside forces that it would decrease. The other notable feature of Buridan's theory was that he quantified how much impetus a body had. According to him, 
impetus depended on the amount of mass an object has. He justifies this by observing it's possible to throw a rock further than a feather, reasoning that a rock has more mass and so acquires more impetus. Likewise, he argued that impetus also depended on speed, saying that if you wanted to jump further, you would take a large run-up in order to acquire sufficient speed. Buridan, very much part of the movement to mathematize natural philosophy, states that impetus is actually equal to the amount of mass multiplied by speed. If this seems familiar, you're quite right, because there's a strong parallel between Buridan's impetus and the Newtonian concept of momentum. His arguments also heavily prefigure the concept of inertia, which would be the key new idea in the physics of the 17th century. Alone, this would be remarkable enough, but Buridan also saw through the implications of his ideas, making a bold argument which undermined another cornerstone of Aristotle's theories. In Aristotelian natural philosophy, there were four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. But the celestial bodies were considered a fundamentally different type of matter, called ether, which was subject to a different sort of physics. Buridan challenged this idea by applying his theory of impetus to the celestial realm. It had long been observed that as celestial bodies move through space, they seem to move indefinitely. In Buridan's new physics, this made sense, as the persistent motion was due to the fact that they have some impetus and don't meet any resistance as they move. There was no need to posit, then, the existence of an ether. Aristotle was wrong. The physics on Earth were the same as the physics in the heavens. And this concludes today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be back, hopefully with another episode, to conclude this series on Roger Bacon. Then we'll probably have a long break while I research the next series on Copernicus and Vesalius. Until next time.